Lucia National Conservation Fund has been seven to eight years in the making. It started with the Sustainable Financing and Management of Eastern Caribbean Marine Ecosystems Project, which started in 2011 and ended in 2016. The relevant components of that project to the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund were the establishment of a sustainable financing architecture, leading to the establishment of the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. And equally important, the establishment of national conservation trust funds in five of the participating countries, so five <laughs> OECS participating countries. So we should all be very proud that we are in fact taking the lead in the establishment of a national conservation fund, an endowment fund at that too. A footnote that I would like to add here is that the conservation trust fund standards have identified a gestation period of at least 10 years for the establishment of these funds. And we have been able to do it in seven to eight years. And that's through a lot of hard work through a lot of agencies and a lot of assistance. The endowment funds for the respective National Conservation Trust funds were obtained from the Jeff 4 cycle. Each country allocated 4.5 million US dollars to the individual endowment funds. And that in many sense helped us to expedite from that 10 years to seven to eight years. These funds are managed by the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. And the board of the CBF is responsible for identifying and engaging the asset managers. As an endowment fund, the National Conservation Trust funds are allowed to draw down on their annual interest. For the first two years, these National Conservation Trust funds are eligible to draw down the entire interest. After the second anniversary, these funds will have to provide a one-to-one -one match. So you can imagine, after this launch, most of the work is going to be focused on raising funds to further capitalize our endowment fund. During the project phase, a group of agencies and like-minded persons had constituted a project steering committee. And this project steering committee really worked very hard to establish the structure, composition, and governance of the proposed St. Lucia National Conservation Fund. Many times we went to meetings and we didn't have quorum. Many times people would say they would come to meetings and they didn't show up. But we persisted and we are here today. Many of you who worked so diligently are in the audience. And I'm really quite trepidatious to call names, lest I missed out some. Nevertheless, it would be remiss of us not to mention the hard work put in by Mr. John Callix, who had chaired the project steering committee at that time. Many a meeting was held in his office. Ms. Shana Emanuel, who at that time represented the fisheries department, Ms. Caroline Eugene, who represented the Department of Sustainable Development. Mr. Bishnu Tulsi and his team from the St. Lucia National Trust. Ms. Nalia Maha from the CYEN and Mr. Vaughan Charles, who at that time was representing the SMME. And of course, we cannot forget Robbie Bovino from the Nature Conservancy. As I said, many a discussion, many a a misunderstanding, not knowing where we are going, not knowing what the CBF was, what the relationship between us and the CBF was going to be. But I think that hard work has paid. In 2015, the cabinet approved the participation of four government agencies on the board. We also requested for a not-for-profit status for the SLUNCF. In addition, this core group of persons who formed the Project Steering Committee worked on identifying the board membership and various governance documents, including a plan for identifying sustainable financing mechanisms for the Solution National Conservation Fund. In 2016, the AG's office approved our not-for-profit status and we became incorporated as the SLU-NCF Inc under the Companies Act. 
chapter 13.01 under the revised laws of St. Lucia. At that time, three members were identified as founding members, the St. Lucia National Trust, the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association, and the government ministry responsible for economic development and planning. And these three founding members were responsible for undertaking all the necessary paperwork for incorporating the SLUNCF. In addition to the three founding members, there are eight other ordinary members. And based on the original intention of the creation of the National Conservation Fund, the St. Lucian National Conservation Fund is an example of public-private partnership. There are four public sector agencies and eight other agencies representing the private sector, NGOs, and CBOs. Together with the Antigua Mapper Trust, we signed the first pre-financing agreement in September 2016. In June 2017, we signed the partnership agreement once again with the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. Today, of the CBF participating countries that have operational National Conservation Trust Funds. We stand next only to the Fonda Marion in Dominican Republic and the Mepa Trust in Antigua and Barbuda. So we are way ahead with the rest of the pack. Indeed, together with Fonda Marion, we will be issuing grants this year, and this is indeed also very exciting. We've spent so much time operationalizing the fund. Now we are ready to issue grants. I want to make special mention of Miss Anita James. Where's Anita? Yeah. Yeah. So Anita was the first biodiversity coordinator. And she always made the clarion call and worked hard for the establishment of a biodiversity fund. Yes. She provided us with much guidance and assistance. I also must mention that in addition to the call for a biodiversity fund, Crispin and his team and the National Environmental Com Commission had also made requests for the establishment of an environmental fund. And more recently, the establishment of a climate change or climate change adaptation fund. All of this augurs well in the sense that we now have a fund that can provide the model for all other sub-funds or all other new funds to be created. We cannot, of course, forget the Jeff Small Grants Program. The program's objectives are very similar to and aligned very closely with the those of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund, and we hope that we will work very closely in a strategic alliance as we look at how we can co-finance and co-sponsor different projects that meet our collective goals and objectives. Work is now ongoing on strengthening the National Designated Authority and designing the country programming for the Green Climate Fund. We hope that there will be close coordination with the SLUNCF and that we can also benefit from the Green Climate Fund. I also need to mention that attempts are on the way for mobilizing financing for sustainable forest management in collaboration with the UN Global Forest Financing Facilitation Network. So there is now an increased impetus, if you will, in the establishment, in, in, in mobilizing resources for conservation and environmental management. Finally, with the increased funding opportunities available for St. Lucia, we hope that there will be coordination and collaboration so that the strategic alliances can be formed in order to ensure that the funds are put to good use. The SLUNCF and the GEF and the SLUNCF and the SLHTA Tourism Enhancement Fund have already been speaking about creating strategic alliances and we hope that we will be the model for such other alliances and collaboration. Thank you very much. The journey to this point has been a long and arduous one with many peaks and troughs.
To be able to launch the fund today is a dream come true for many people who have worked very hard to get to this point. Chief among them, I must say, is Dr. Vasantha Chase and Mr. John Carrick. They started this journey eight to nine years ago. I am proud to state that the fund is taking the lead among all conservation trust funds within the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund Network. We are among the first to sign the partnership agreement with the CBF, and we will also be the first to be issuing grants, working in strategic alliance with the Jeff Small Grants Program in St. Lucia. This grant is for species conservation and restoration of the habitat of the white-breasted thrasher. We are in the process of designing and collaborating with a consortium of agencies in St. Lucia to apply for funding from the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund's ecosystem-based adaptation facility. So Yaba, you'll be hearing from us very soon. <laughs> I am delighted to announce the SLUF, SLUNCF will be signing an MOU with the SLHTA Tourism Enhancement Fund. We are also in discussion with the IGY Rodney Bay Marina and Capella Resorts in Marigo for partnership to develop an environmental marina program through co-financing co of such programs. Recently, we registered with the Accelerator Global Giving Community, which will provide the SLUNCF the opportunity to build skills, access tools, and grow our base of supporters to achieve crowdfunding success. The SLUNCF is developing a resource mobilization plan that will target national, regional, and international entities in order to raise funds to further capitalize our endowment fund. There are some 52 standards for our conservation trust fund, and we can safely say that the SLUNCF has achieved at least 80% of that standard. This stands us in good stead because it shows our governance instruments and documents of international standard. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the official launch of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund. Thank you. I must say, I am quite excited to be here today. And I was even more excited when Dr. Chase called me um, about a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, to ask me to, you know, just provide the experiences that you know, we went through um, establishing the fund. I must say I was introduced to the, to the project of the, um, to establish the fund by two individuals. Um, one is there and one is not here. And I know Crispin, you may not remember, but several years ago, somewhere about 2009 or 10 or so, um, both yourself and Miranda Morris from the System Development Department came to me to tell me um, there is this exciting project that they are involved in. Um, it involves financing, but they needed to get to the permanent sector, Mr. Isaac Anthony at the time, to get his views or his blessings, you know, to participate, participate in the project. Now, being the WDPS, they thought I was the, you know, um, right conduit to go to um, Mr. Anthony. So, um, having given me the, you know, the objectives of the project and the details for the project, I proceeded to inform, you know, Mr. Anthony. And the first thing he told me was, okay, John, um, get a small committee together to examine some of the financing options that have been provided and, you know, provide a response back to Crispin and, and Naranda. So I, I proceeded to do so. And um, there were several options that were provided. Um, which included things like um, um, putting a, some kind of tax on cruise ship passengers or a tax on you know, overseas visitors, um, a tax on water extraction, um, trying to, to increase the fees for you know, dives and you know, some of the other activities that we do um, on islands. So the committee met and we said, you know, at that time, it was 2009, eight, nine or so, and we were just going through the financial crisis. And the policy of the government at that time was, you know, no increases in anything, in taxes, in, in fees, whatever it was. So, so we went back and we told the committee or uh, Mr. Dove and Noranda that, look, um, these alternatives that these finance mechanisms that you have given to us, you know, they're not able to be, um, they're not possible. 
they cannot work, so therefore, you know, um, we have to look for alternate, you know, um, 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 strategies. So I was happy, I felt that was the end for me of my involvement in the project, because looking at the um, objectives of the project, where we were supposed to establish the funds, and we were already thinking of going through legislation, and we had to, um, the fund is a, is a, from the CBF is a, is a matching grant. So we had to generate our own financing for the project. So I was very apprehensive about you know, identifying strategies to, um, to help us achieve the one-to-one -one matching grant. So I was never um, very happy because I realized that it would have been very difficult for us to you know, identify the types of um, strategies to do so. And secondly, anytime you speak about you know, establishing anything by legislation, it means that you have to go through the AG's office, um, you have to um, develop the legislation through the draft people. It, it always takes some time. So I thought, you know, hey, this product is really going to be, you know, um, a very, um, I would say difficult, but very challenging project. And, you know, do we have what we have, do we have what it takes to, you know, to go the full course? So I was quite happy to tell, you know, Crispin and Miranda, hey, you know, this thing cannot work, so um, please tell um, the World Bank and Gem that we need to have some alternative strategies. However, what came back was, okay, John, um, these strategies cannot work, then you may have to, you're on the committee, may have to now identify other strategies to help us identify the funds. So, obviously, I mean, I don't share, I don't share it from challenges, so we took up the challenge. Um, and we, we began trying to think of, you know, alternatives, you know, for, for the project. But along the way, um, Hurricane Thomas struck, so our, our attention was, was moved from the financing project into, you know, um, trying to recover from Hurricane Thomas. So, having done all of this, um, we encountered a number of challenges um, along the way. And the first one, as I said, was to identify the, you know, alternatives for the strategies to finance our local trust fund. Um, another challenge that we also faced along the way was, whilst we were, you know, discussing and meeting and, and trying to come up with these um, strategies, um, the CDB, who was supposed to have been the um, project, well, what I call coordinators, um, suddenly pulled out. So we said, okay, um, we will have the OCS secretary, right? So uh, they. They are, are, are used to working with you know, Caribbean countries or the OSS countries, so they would be the natural choice. They started, but they pulled out again. So we said, well, um, and for a while it looked like the project wouldn't continue because there was nobody who, who we, we had in mind to be the project supervisor or coordinator because there are um, eight countries involved. But then suddenly um, the TNC said, look, you know, we don't mind. Um, we worked in the region, we, we worked in all of the islands, so why not have us as being the project coordinators? There were discussions amongst the islands and um, we all agreed because we didn't want to lose the funding and we felt that even though the project was a challenge, but you know, the objectives of trying to establish a sustainable financing mechanism for protected areas was a noble um, objective. And you know, we could really put our, our shoulders together and try to get you know, the, the project um, you know, organized. So we supported the TNC in um, the projects, being the projects um, coordinator. The next step was that um, I think in 2011 or 12, there's a meeting in Grenada where um, all of the countries came together, that's in 2010, um, where we all discussed the issues with the um, strategies. And we all adamant that you know we were not able to you know um, use the, the the strategies provided you know to come up with these um, the financing mechanism. So at the meeting, um, another challenge, another issue was raised. Why is it that we had to you know have the matching grants? Uh, why is it that we could not just receive the funding from the CBF you know, without providing the matching grants? Uh, there was another alternative which we which which we provided was okay. Um, why can't we get a percentage of um, the funds from the CBF, instead of having to, you know, because you know we couldn't have, you know, um, um, raised whatever allocation we were receiving. And the third point was, by the way, um, what is each country's allocation? You know, so we could determine, you know, what we have to, um, you know, match in, in, in each country. So these were, these were uh, discussed at the meeting. 
And it was agreed that, um, okay, fine, you couldn't raise the funds with the, 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 the strategy, so why not have somebody come in to assist all of the countries in identifying new strategies? So we agreed to that, and that is where Dr. Haas came into um, the picture. Dr. Haas um, was from the US, and he was contracted to come to the Caribbean, and in 20, I think, 13, um, he met with myself and some of the um, officials from the, from the budget, the, the officer of the budget. And based on that meeting, we agreed to have a um, seminar on sustainable financing options for conservation um, to help us to, de to design and come up with you know, these strategies. So um, we actually came up with a number of objectives for the seminar. And they were one, to raise awareness of the range of available mechanisms at the highest levels of governments. We wanted to get everybody involved from not just the officers, but the ministers of government, the permanent secretaries, deputy permanent secretaries. Um, two, to generate a forward momentum and a plan of action for designing and implementing the mechanism of a suite of mechanisms in St. Lucia. So again, you can see St. Lucia was always you know, in the forefront of, in all of these um, discussions. Uh, we took it upon our own to say, look, we couldn't do it, so let's, from our own, figure out what are the best alternatives that we can use, and Dr. Um, has gladly decided to assist us. The first workshop was held in 2014, and we had a number of pan, um, panel experts. We had Karen McDonald, who is here today. I don't, I'm not sure if Karen really remembers um, that first meeting. There was Professor Haas from the Colorado State University, and he was um, who specializes in tourism, natural resource management, and protected area financing. There's a representative from the, from the Belize PA Conservation Trust, who also had um, um, experience in you know, identifying or resources, and we had Ms. Jennifer Alexis Ellard, who was a travel philanthropy specialist. Coming out of that meeting, um, there were several strategies that were identified. Um, there's one philanthropy, so we said, look, um, we were saying that people like Oprah Winfrey comes to St. Lucia, you know, and a number of other movie stars, you know, whether they come in quietly, um, but why not approach them, because they, I think, would understand what we're trying to do, so that was one. Um, supported by local companies. We said, look, our major companies like, um, well, it was Massey's, at that time was um, um, Super J, um, Digicel, it was Lime at the time, not Flow, um, Sunshine Distillers, the brewery. Why not, you know, try to get these companies involved too? Um, maybe give us a, a one shot, you know, um, um, allocation or disbursement. Um, we also spoke about amalgamating payment fees when divers and other people come into St. Lucia they have to pay several different fees at several different times. So we're saying, look, why not amalgamate all the fees, let the trust fund collect the fees, um, distribute to these companies, and we then retain a 2 to 3 4% you know, to go to the trust fund. Um, they use of credit cards and debit cards. Again, people can pay for these um, tours, whatever it is overseas. So um, again, they use the trust fund's um, website, and we again retain a small fee um, for, our, for our service. Um, then we also looked at the voluntary fees on airline passenger tickets or on um, well, visitors who are here and a fee for cruise ship passengers. Um, we felt the cruise ship passengers fee was not something that we wanted to get into at the moment because of what happened several years ago where I think the head tax with the CARICOM heads of government meeting had agreed to put on the $10 US head tax um, on cruise ship passengers. But somehow that never materialized because um, by the time the prime ministers got back home, everybody, you know, was looking to see how they could have reduced that fee. So that never materialized. So we felt, you know, at right now was not a good idea. Um, the voluntary fee on airline passengers tickets, we thought it could work, but it could work if it is implemented, you know, by everybody, all the countries participating. And we felt we could have, uh, you know, spoken to um, some of the regional organizations like TNC themselves, CARICOM, um, to see whether that would have been a possibility. So that is still on the cards. I don't think we have ever taken it off. Um, so it's still something that I think the trust fund can also um, um, consider as they move along. At that time, um, as Dr. Dr. Chase pointed out, we decided to you know, really put together a small committee um, to you know, look into not just the, the, the financing options, but to oversee the entire project. And again, somehow, 
I'm not sure how I got involved, I'm not sure how I became the chair of that committee, but it's just a project that just did not want to go away from me. For whatever reasons, I'm not sure. But I'm happy that I stayed. Um, I must say the committee, as Dr. Chase pointed out, were very committed, very dedicated. She mentioned some of the names of the people who were on the committee, and some of them are here, like Caroline and Snalio, um, Vaughn, is, Vaughn is here as well. Um, Shanna is also here. Um, Miss Peter, who is here, and sometimes Mr. Nelson, who is to deputize for her, they're all here. And I must say, um, I've worked on many, many committees um, in my short life, but that committee, I, I really enjoyed working with them. There were numerous disagreements on you know, some of the issues, I would say no, but still we came back day after day, month after month, you know, to be the challenge of trying to get this project you know, up and running. I think one of the good things that, that we did was we began organizing ourselves even long before the actual project document was signed. The project was signed uh, or was approved by the World Bank in 2011 and TNC signed the, the, the documents in 2012. But as I said before, by 28 and 29, we were already involved in you know, some of the activities. So even if the first, um, between 2012 and 20, well, 10 and 12, um, the activities were centered around trying to get TNC to meet all the conditions um, to get the document signed. Um, but we still worked you know, very diligently, um, calling meetings uh, probably every month. Sometimes um, we spent a whole afternoon you know, discussing the issues. But you know, slowly but surely we saw that you know, we, we, were, we were making some headway um, with the project. Um, so after the project was signed, it meant that now, you know, we really had to be looking at, you know, how do we establish the National Conservation Trust Fund? Yes, we were talking about, you know, the financing mechanisms and so on, but the thing was, the project is signed, we have four years, you know, to get everything organized. So, as all of the islands had, you know, we had our meetings, um, everybody was saying, look, okay, let's, we have to legislate, go to parliament, etc. So, Yes, as part of the project, we brought in an attorney. And she was saying, you know, but wait a minute, you know, um, there's a, a simpler way to do this activity and a quicker way. Um, if you want to establish a not-for-profit making organization or a statutory, which has the same objectives of a statutory body that you want to establish, why not establish a company, a not-for-profit making company, uh, with bylaws and articles of association, and it would have the same impact that you want with your, uh, you know, your statutory body. So, we were all surprised, and at first we thought it wouldn't work. Um, so we had several discussions, but then we said, okay, we gave the go-ahead for her to begin looking at, you know, a company. Um, so within a couple of months, she, based on, you know, or with advice from the steering committee, she was able to prepare the bylaws and the articles of association um, for us to review. So we began reviewing the document, and. At that time, um, the TNC were also on our steering committee um, through Mr. Um, Robbie Bovino. And so we were able to use the lawyers to guide us and help us to you know, um, improve the articles and the bylaws. And um, so by the end of that year, we had a completely revised set of articles of association bylaws. But then when we went back to um, the attorney, um, to begin the registration process, um, well, two things happened. One, we were told that the, what we had revised um, did not follow the, um, the formats in the Companies Act. So we had to go back in and do some further revision. Um, and secondly, the original attorney was not available. So we were in a quandary um, because we say, you know, to get somebody new to come back in and do this thing all over again is going to cause a problem. Um, however, we did, through Dr. Chase's um, efforts, we did find another attorney and she was very instrumental in helping us to put together, you know, the bylaws and articles association. And she was also very um, instrumental in helping us to establish the company. So, um, at that time, you know, we were discussing some, with some of the other islands and um, I must say, when we started the process, in terms of doing the um, establishing a company, we started last. You know, all of the other analysts were way, way ahead of us in terms of you know um, 
speaking to the AG's office about the legislation, doing what they wanted to do. And, you know, and I said to myself, you know something, every time we go to a meeting, this component, we had nothing but to say. So, so I told the committee, you know, people, we need to get this thing going. And let's see how we can, you know, meet our deadlines um, in the quickest possible way, which is why the attorney came up with, you know, um, getting the company um, um, organized. And surprisingly, when we began talking to the other countries and we indicated, look, you know, we're getting this company organized and um, it could do the same thing that you want to do, people began listening and they began, you know, thinking, hey, you know, maybe this might work for us as well. So we began sharing the information with them, um, either directly or through TNC. I remember meeting Diane Black from Antigua at the meeting in, in, in Nevis. And as soon as I met her, she said, you know, John, I heard you're doing something different from all of us. So what is it that you're doing? So I explained to her, she said, okay, can you send me, you know, your bylaws and your articles of association and probably your company's act? So I did, I did send it to her. I didn't hear from her for a while. Then at our next meeting, I heard that Antigua was also considering doing the same thing. Um, then um, St. Benson said, look, they were having a lot of problems, you know, with the legislation. So again, it came to us, you know, how did you, you know, establish your, or your company? So he told me, okay, but come across the events for about three to four days, speak to our committee and um, our, our well, PS is there, explain what you've done in St. Lucia and see whether, you know, you can convince them to go our route. So through TNC support, um, or CBF, I'm not sure, probably CBF, through CBF, both, okay. So I was able to go to um, St. Vincent and I met with their committee, I met with the, the chair and everybody, and um, I met the Minister of Tourism. And I was able to explain, you know, I gave them a copy of our bylaws, Article of Association, Companies Act, and to them, look, you know, uh, as long as you have a Companies Act, in fact, I also met the attorney who was doing the same thing. And she told me, you know, it can work based on what their company, Companies Act says and ours are very similar. Um, a few changes have to be made. And in fact, for a while, um, St. Vincent, because we had to change attorneys, St. Vincent actually got the, um, I think, the, the trust fund registered before ours. Uh, because we had to go through a study different process where all our directors had to be interviewed by the AG's office before that was done. I don't think that's the case in St. Vincent. So, so for a while, they were slightly ahead. Um, I also got an invitation to go to the Bahamas. I remember being in office one morning and I got a call from Mr. Mr. Um, Reach in Bahamas. Can I come across to the Bahamas next week to discuss the same, um, the same thing with their, um, but the Bahamas Trust Fund? However, their trust fund was being done through legislation. So they wanted to see how the two mechanisms were different, the two systems were different. So I spoke to the PS and I said, okay, you can go ahead. Um, you know, so another three days again through TNC and CBF. And again, they were quite amazed at what we were doing because for them, it took them almost two years to go through the legislation, um, get the AG's office to you know, um, get everything organized and to get to Parliament. Um, and they also recognized you know, some, some um, advantages to our, to, our, to our process. Because one of the things that we did in establishing our company was that we, we were able to be a little flexible by um, having by making it possible to have different windows attached to the trust fund. So for instance, you can have a window um, for the environment. And I remember there was a consultancy um, with the Sustainable Development Department where um, they were looking at an environmental trust fund. And we were saying, look, we have the trust fund being established. So why can't we have a window within the trust fund to you know, take care of the environment? And again, they went with that. And, um, and, and if you look at the reports, they did suggest that we also use the trust fund, you know, for that. Um, so we have a, we can have a window for adaptation measures, a window for climate change, a window for energy. So all we have to do is to ensure we have the um, the right mechanism and structure for each of these windows. Um, but you have the same agency involved in you know managing you know funds and for for natural resource management or protected areas management. So that's one area in which I think we are totally different, you know, from the other countries where. Um, we, if, we, if we activate these windows, um, I think we know we can have a, a structure or a, a modality that everybody else in the Caribbean you know, can emulate. So, um, so we're able to establish the, the trust fund, finally. And um, 
the next step was to you know have our executive director and that is where you know mr cherry came in as our first executive director and his task basically was to help us to um get all the documents ready for us to access the um the initial grant operational grant from the cbf and i must say mr cherry working with the committee uh, was able to accomplish you know um at least the grant making document and the operational official document for us to access the grants from um, the CBF. And in 20, 2016, when um, the CBF held its annual meeting here, um, we signed that agreement right there in this setting um, to access um, that facility from the CBF. And I think we were the second in all of the islands to do so. And um, as I said before, we were um, very instrumental in being very innovative. So we're here today. And um, like I said, I'm very happy that I'm here. Um, I'm excited. I always felt that this trust fund was a very innovative idea, and a number of innovations can come out of the trust fund. Um, so I'm hoping that um, as the trust fund, you know, develops and, and, and grows, we can see the innovation, you know, continuing with the trust fund. I believe that, um, and I settled from day one, because of the various windows that we have and the structure of the trust fund, we might be able to, well, not might, when the trust fund develops, we should be able to access grant funding from the Green Climate Fund and other types of, uh, other types of funding uh, being offered for you know, natural resource management. So, once again, Dr. Chase, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. Um, I also want to pledge my support to the, um, the trust. Um, just want to say one more thing. As I said before, some of this project doesn't seem to want to leave me. When I left the Ministry of Economic Development, I entered the Ministry of Education. At that time, the government changed, and guess what happened? Sustainable Development became part of the ministry, so I was still involved with the Trust Fund. I left the Ministry of Education, came to the Ministry of Agriculture, Natural Resources there, Fisheries is there, so I'm still involved with the Trust Fund. So I think, I believe that um, thanks to Crispin, I don't know if you had the foresight, Crispin, but I've been involved for a while, and um, I do want to remain involved. And I look forward to Dr. Chase making whatever contribution I can, you know, to the trust fund in any way that. So feel free, feel free to call me, and I can provide any assistance that I can. Thank you, everybody. And really, the, the way I see this process of the launching of the fund is that everyone at the head table and all of you um, in the audience are true champions of this process. All of you. All of you have put a lot of effort in this. We, we've heard already from Dr. Chase, Mr. Sherry, and Mr. Calix about the rich history in getting to this point. Um, there was something mentioned during the prayer that, that really resonated with, with me, and that is the word nourishment. I think that's the task we all have now, that you all have now. We have made it to this point, there have been some strong wins, as you saw already, that have been trying to get the, maybe the, the fund off course or taking another route, but we have had great sailors and captains keeping on track. But now comes the time to continue to nourish this trust fund. And that is what the CBF and the San Lucia National Conservation Fund partnership is about. It's about nourishing the fund here and nourishing the ones in the rest of the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund is proud to be a partner of the San Lucia National Conservation Fund. I, I won't repeat again how the SLUNCF has been a leader, a shining star in this whole process. Um, I think we, we, we already heard right now from Mr. Calix about how even in the strategy to develop the trust funds, San Lucia played a leading role. And now, in the, in the more operational phase of the establishment of the other trust funds, San Lucia is also serving as an example to the rest of the countries. Today, that initial process that began, they were talking about 10 years or, or so. It's actually more like 12, believe it or not. In 2006 was when two countries, Grenada and, bah and Bahamas, really challenged the rest of their peers to come together in this process that is also linked to the Caribbean Challenge Initiative. Today we have 10 countries that are involved in this financial architecture being built. And truly, I really would like to thank everyone here, everyone at the head table for your leadership role in this process. 
Um, we, we also like to, to see this partnership as something beyond channeling resources from the CBF to the National Conservation Trust Funds. This, this partnership goes well beyond that. It's about knowledge sharing. It's about participatory governance. I don't know how many of you here in the room, or I don't know if to call this a room, but in this setting, um, realize that when we sign a partnership agreement with one of the conservation trust funds, that also means that one of the members of the board of the national fund, the respective national fund, becomes a member of our fund. So it's not only about financial resources flow, it's about joint decision making, transparent participatory decision making. And Mr. Sherry is actually a CBF director. So the St. Lucia National Fund nominated him to be part of our board and he's now a full-fledged member of our board. So I think that's a very important aspect of this partnership. It's, we are trying to be holistic and compassing and really moving forward as a, as a true um, network. Um, it was mentioned during the different remarks also about the sustainable financial mechanisms and match requirements. This partnership is also about working with the San Lucia Fund and finding the avenues and the ways of fulfilling those match requirements. It is not just uh, a requirement that we put on a piece of paper when we sign the, the partnership agreement. It's something we are here to work together with you. And we are sure that all the efforts that you're already making are going to be fruitful. We, we can see that already with the mentioning of the MOU with the San Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association. We're, we're really happy to see those kinds of innovative partnerships um, coming to life. Um, with that, I would like to end my remarks by saying that the San Lucia National Fund and all of you champions in this room really have an open door and a friend in the CBF and all of our staff to continue to move forward in this great um, process. This is literally, this launch event is literally the beginning. It's not an end. It is the beginning of, of the rest of the journey. Thank you very much. This is a little historic day, auspicious day for us, for me in particular. Many, many years ago, 30 something years ago, I sat around a table with people like Gabriel Charles and Robert DeVoe sit on Cumberland in the South talking about St. Lucia's first protected areas plan. And in that very plan, there was a need to find co-financing. Co and we had to go all around the world, the Swedish Development Fund, USAID. We had to go to DFID, the World Wildlife Fund, the MacArthur Foundations, the Kellogg's Foundations to look in for funding. Very difficult, very competitive, very exhaustive. So, as I walked in here today, I was reminiscing a bit, for example, thinking about those days when it was difficult to find co-funding, a plethora of ideas. Crispin would tell you, we had ideas that would reach the stars, but we had no money. And because we had no money, many of those ideas stayed in, the, in, a, in, a, in our drawers and never got implemented. So this moment, in the evolution of environmental thought in St. Lucia, environmental practice in St. Lucia, this is auspicious. This is historic. This is important. And for, it's from that perspective as a solution, I see this as being a moment in time, a moment that has to be marked because it has given us resources to do what many of our forefathers, foreparents, grandfathers wanted to do. And I must thank the Nature Conservancy because they were there with us back in the early, late 1980s. Uh, people like Brad Northrop came to Solution and helped us to design the stewardship plan on private property for St. Lucia. So this is not your first time into St. Lucia in that respect. You all have been there with us in the early days of protected areas. On behalf of Stephen O'Malley, our resident representative, UN resident coordinator for Barbados and the OECS, Yoko Watanabe, who is the global manager for the Just Small Grants program out of UNDP New York. Dr. Barbara Graham, the chair of our National Steering Committee. We congratulate you, Vasant, an excellent job, Mr. Cherry, on piloting the early days. P.S. Calix, on the excellent work you all have done. We are looking forward to collaboration, to partnerships that can bring St. Lucia to another stage of development. When the history of environment and movement in St. Lucia is written, this will be marked as an important day. Congratulations, St. Lucia National Contribution Fund. This project meant a lot to me. Yay. 
Um, I, it was the first thing that was handed to me in November 2012 um, when I was at the Department of Fisheries. And believe me, there have been so many learning opportunities and so much has happened and a lot has passed. But to be here, to be standing here in front of all of you today, it means a lot. And Dr. Chase, you know, um, a lot of people held my hand through this. I was the fisheries focal point and it, it means a lot to be here and to be at the launch. We had a lot of back and forth about who should be first and how we're going to be first. And it really, really built me, I think, and built me into a better um, person. And I honestly believe in this fund. I know it's going to be a game changer. It, it has already been a game changer. This entire process has changed everything for this country. And I want to say that on the behalf of the Department of Sustainable Development, we finally have a national donor agency, our very own, with donor, with all the decisions being nationally determined by a board that is committed to making a difference. And it feels good to be here and to be a part of this process. And I know um, at the department with our mandate for coastal zone, biodiversity, climate change, and of course, sustainable development in itself, we will be here and we will be supporting the fund all the way through. So I bid congratulations to everyone involved. And I also want to say thank you to everyone who has been a part of this process. And I know it's just the beginning, like Java said. And though it's the beginning, it's a well-deserved beginning. Thank you very much. The Caribbean Youth Environment Network joined this process a little later on, about 2014, 2015. But in, it has been a very, very great learning experience for me personally. I work directly with the fund, um, operationalizing or assisting in operationalizing it and seeing it at this, it's, it's very emotional. Um, and seeing how all of our efforts have finally been realized, I am happy today to be part of this process. I also want to say that whoever thought um, that it was important that the Caribbean Youth Environment Network should be part of this process and also given the opportunity to sit as a member of the board of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund, I think it is a very important um, milestone in the sense that you have young persons participating in decision-making processes that are very, very important to the development of St. Lucia. And I think that just the fact that myself and also our Assistant Secretary, Mr. Cornelius Williams, who is the, assist, um, the alternate director on the board, I think it augurs well for our future um, as a small island developing state and also for young persons so that we also know that we're not left behind in the development of our country. So I am very, very happy to be here and I congratulate Dr. Chase and every other member of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund Board. Um, I got a lot of support from the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, from the Nature Conservancy, and I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Chase and to Mr. Calix for their support over the past few years. Um, they encouraged me all the time. And Shana, of course, <laughs> also I'm not forgetting Shana. Um, whatever questions that I had, she answered them. We spoke a lot, we, you know, we collaborated, we discussed, we worked together. And I think it is very important that as a young person, on my way out, in a sense. <laughs> um, I think that um, this, this fun um, is a shining example for all of us in St. Lucia, and by extension in the region and internationally, that we can do things once we put our minds to it, and then we work hard collaboratively, not forgetting that, yes, there are challenges, but once we have one goal in mind, thinking of what the future will be for um, our younger generation. So um, I think that 
it is something that we should always keep in our hearts that yes, it is possible once we are determined to get it done. Congratulations once again.